We will start a series of uh, lectures to talk about uh, bronchopulmonary dysplasia. This series will uh, be composed of three lectures. Today I will present uh, part one of this series. The objectives of part one is an introduc introduction to bronchopulmonary dysplasia. We will standardize the definition. We will talk about pathology and pathogenesis, and most important, to summarize the interventions and the evidence behind each intervention. Uh, talking about history of bronchopulmonary dysplasia, the definition, the definition started in 1967 by Northway, who defined a group of premature babies who required uh, mechanical ventilation at that time. Their mean age was 34 weeks gestation, their mean weight was 2.4 kilograms, and all of them required oxygen at 28 days of age. All of them had progressive changes on chest x-ray. As you can see here, the lungs appear cystic and scarred with areas of hyperinflation and thickness. This was the first time to know about bronchopulmonary dysplasia, which was solely because of use of uh, mechanical ventilators in premature babies. The definition of, <coughs> of bronchopulmonary dysplasia started to be modified over time. The initial modification came in 1979 by Bancillary and his colleagues, and Bancillary is one of the known figures in bronchopulmonary dysplasia. He uh, updated the definition to include supplemental oxygen at 28 days, tachypnea and crackles or uh, retractions, and chronic changes on chest x-ray. In 1988, the definition has been modified to include only supplemental oxygen at 36 weeks post-menstrual age. And in 2000, the uh, definition, the severity-based definition, came by the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. This new definition uh, classified uh, babies into two categories, either less than 32 weeks or more than or equal to 32 weeks. And here, you can see the difference is in the time only, while the criteria are the same. So at the point of assessment for the first group is at 36 weeks post-menstrual age, while for the second group it's at 28 to 56 days post-natal uh, age or at time of discharge to home. During this period for either group, the requirement will be treatment with oxygen more than 21% for at least 28 days. Now, this is the first criteria, and the second criteria will classify patients into mild, moderate, and severe. So, for the mild, if the baby is breathing room air at 36 weeks for the first group or uh, by 56 days in the second group, he will be classified as mild while the moderate group is for babies who are requiring less than 30% at the point of assessment, and for the severe group, if they are requiring more than or equal to 30% and or positive pressure ventilation at time of assessment. Here we need to uh, uh, clarify uh, three points. The first one is that if the baby needs 20, more than 21% for at least 28 days before reaching the point of assessment. This means that this baby is classified as bronchopulmonary dysplasia. But in order to classify him as mild, moderate, or severe, we have to wait until 36 weeks for babies less than 32 or, something, uh, or uh, 56 days for babies more than 32 weeks gestation. The second point is that if we have interrupted periods of need for oxygen, for example, he needed uh, supplemental oxygen for the first 14 days, and then he improved for, let's say, two or three days, then deteriorated again and needed another supplemental oxygen for another 14 days, then he fulfills the criteria as long as the two periods are within the point of assessment for the specific gestational age group. And the third point uh, that I need to, to, to 
uh, uh, clear is that some babies continue to require oxygen by nasal cannula which is 21 percent and this one does not fulfill the criteria of having or need for more than 21 percent so the need for flow through nasal cannula or any other device that is only 21 percent does not classify these babies as having bronchopulmonary dysplasia now in order to understand why the bronchopulmonary dysplasia happens and why there is a difference between the old bronchopulmonary dysplasia and the new bronchopulmonary dysplasia we need to understand the stages of development of the respiratory system the respiratory system development from embryonic life till adult life passes through five stages if you want to remember these stages i used to to use the the letters as epcsa epcsa and remember the number seven so e for embryonic and it lasts in the first seven weeks while p from seven to seventeen then c canalicular lasts from seven to 27 then s for saccular from 17 to around 37 and the last stage is the alveolar which starts from 36 or 37 and continues until eight years of age so epcsa embryonic pseudoglanular canalicular saccular and alveolar 0 to 7 7 to 17 17 to 27 27 to 37 and then more the first stage which is the embryonic and in the first seven weeks of life includes the formation of lung butt and differentiation into trachea and bronchi definitely this is an abortion and it's not included in our uh, uh, category of patients the second stage is the pseudoglanular which starts from 7 to 17 and still very early to be revived and here includes the uh, branching of bronchial tree formation of respiratory parenchyma and type 2 pneumatocytes start to appear at this stage here in the first two stages embryonic and pseudoglanular the uh, conceptual outcome is non-viable then the viability starts somewhere in the third stage the canalicular stage which starts actually from 17 and ends at around 27 weeks of uh, uh, gestation during this canalicular stage what happens is that the lungs start to uh, 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 form its peripheral parts there will be increased vascularization uh, vascularization and then type 1 pneumatocytes start to appear and air blood interference starts to form and this is the stage where the new uh, the, the new uh, bronchopulmonary dysplasia started to appear contrary to the secular stage or the alveolar stage which comes later and we will explain the difference between the uh, new and old BPD in the secular stage which starts from 27 and ends at around 37 or 36 weeks gestation there will be a formation of alveolar saccules and detectable surfactant in the amniotic fluid the last stage will include the formation of mature alveoli and proliferation uh, and expansion we will not go in details regarding the pathogenesis but uh, lots of factors in uh, contribute to uh, the development of uh, bronchopulmonary dysplasia either directly or indirectly through increased rate of uh, uh, preterm deliveries of these factors there is a rule for genetic uh, uh, differences and uh, the most important factor in development of bronchopulmonary dysplasia as we know is the mechanical ventilation mechanical ventilators are well known to have trauma to or to cause a trauma to the respiratory system we have uh, two major types of traumas either barotrauma or volutrauma barotrauma due to the pressure and volutrauma due to the volume 
oxygen therapy itself because it releases oxygen free radicals and this is uh, one of the important pathogenetic uh, factors in bronchopulmonary dysplasia chorioamnitis either by causing premature delivery or directly by affecting the inflammatory cascades can lead to bronchopulmonary dysplasia bacteria sepsis pda there is a lot of talk about pda but uh, to summarize uh, i would like to mention two factors although PDA itself is a risk factor for pathogenesis. We need to know that surgical management or surgical closure of PDA has been proved to be associated with increased uh, incidence of bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Then lung colonization with urea plasma, urea lyticum was found to be associated with increased risk of bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Now here we'll talk about uh, the old versus a new uh, bronchopulmonary dysplasia. In the old bronchopulmonary dysplasia, we were talking about babies late preterm who present at around uh, uh, the saccular stage or even after the saccular stage when most of the lung tissue has been formed and then we introduce the mechanical ventilation to these babies. The effect here is disturbance to the normal growth and the result will be airway injury, inflammation and parenchymal fibrosis due to mechanical ventilation and oxygen toxicity as you can see from the histopathology picture here. If we compare it to the new BPD, we are talking about a rest of development of the lung, a rest of development. So usually uh, at the canalicular stage, those babies, they do not have well-formed or enough number of alveoli formed. And the problem here is that no further progression or no further development in the lung parenchyma, rather than due to trauma of mechanical ventilators themselves. So we will see here that there is decreased septation and alveolar hypoplasia leading to fewer and larger alveoli. So the result will be less surface area for gas exchange. There will be dysregulation of the vascular development leading to abnormal disruption of alveolar capillaries and thickened muscular layer of pulmonary arterioles. You can see here that the x-ray is totally different from the previous one, the old one. You can see here the cystic changes and the new one, you see that it's almost normal. Now we will start in the last part of my lecture. There, here we'll be presenting three slides about an evidence-based approach to the management of uh, bronchopulmonary dysplasia. We classified or uh, we have uh, uh, divided the interventions into uh, three stages. We will start from the first stage or first phase, which is the early phase, up to one postnatal week and includes the following uh, interventions. About oxygen supplementation, here the uh, current status recommends that a wide variation in the acceptable oxygen saturation, but usually we accept oxygen down to 95 percent details of the oxygen supplementation will come in the uh, uh, third uh, sorry in the second lecture uh, of this series for the ventilatory strategy we will talk about avoiding ventilation as, mu as much as possible but if the baby is intubated we prefer to give early surfactant and here the level of evidence is 1 and the recommendation level is A. The use of short inspiratory time from 0.24 to 0.4 seconds and rapid rates from 40 to 60 per minute. In addition to low PIP from 30 to 20 and moderate PIP from 4 to 6 with the tidal volume from 3 to 6 ml per kg. Extubate early to uh, uh, synchronize nasal uh, intermittent positive pressure ventilation or nasal CPAP. Blood gas target for the pH 7.25 to 7.35 for PO2 from 40 to 60 
from PCO2 for PCO2 from 45 to 55 millimeter mercury and the use of high frequency ventilation as rescue uh, if conventional uh, ventilation fails here the level of evidence is one but the uh, grade of recommendation is C what about methyl xanthines, uh, aminophilin, thiophilin, and caffeine? Uh, it is uh, the current status is that they improve successful extubation rate, and they are associated with decreased bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Vitamin A is, uh, if considered, uh, the dose is uh, 5,000 international unit, administered intramuscularly three times per week for four weeks. One additional infant survived without BPD for every 14 to 15 infants who received vitamin A. So 14 to 15 is the number needed to treat. And the problem of vitamin A is that it's given intramuscular and clinically it's not easily applicable. Fluids uh, prefer to uh, have fluid restriction uh, that may decrease the BPD. For nutrition, and this is very important, you have to provide increased energy intake. The uh, second phase is the evolving phase, which is after one week of the postnatal week uh, to 36 weeks BMA. For the oxygen supplementation, same as the previous one, ventilatory strategy at this stage is to avoid endotracheal intubation, the same maximize non-invasive ventilation uh, for respiratory support and blood gas targets here is uh, pH 7.25 to 7.35 PO2 50 to 70 and PCO2 here we allow uh, a bit higher CO2 up to 60 or sometimes 65 which is known as permissive hypercapnia uh, methyl xanthines, the same vitamin A the same uh, about steroids and this is a time to discuss steroids uh, I mean a time for the baby, but uh, for uh, our lecture series, I dedicated the last part, the third part of this series uh, for the uh, detailed talk about steroid management in BPD. So dexamethasone is effective in weaning of uh, mechanical ventilation when used uh, moderately early and delayed. We will again talk in details later about dexamethasone. Diuretics, uh, furizomide may be used daily or every other day with uh, transient improvement in lung function. Spironolactone and thiazide, uh, chronic therapy that improves lung function and decreases oxygen uh, requirement. Nutrition, same as early phase. The last phase is the uh, established phase when we have already established bronchopulmonary dysplasia. At this time, oxygen supplementation for prevention of pulmonary hypertension and core pulmonal, a wide variation in the acceptable oxygen saturation levels, uh, but generally, again, it is less than 95%. The ventilatory strategy here, uh, uh, almost the same as the second stage, but again, we accept CO2 up to 65 millimeter mercury. While steroids here, we may uh, consider oral prednisolone that's may, that may be helpful in weaning oxygen. Diuretics as a chronic therapy, uh, beta agonists here, uh, it may give uh, transient relief, but uh, uh, there are uh, side effects and it's not standard treatment. They uh, say that you can use the beta agonists in acute stages, but not for a chronic uh, use. Anticholinergics may be used in combination with beta agonists in infants with bronchospasm, increased compliance and decreased respiratory resistance. Nutrition same as the previous stages and immunization, we have not to forget to give them prophylaxis against RSV and influenza uh, that decreases incidence of rehospitalization and morbidity. Now, this, by this we end the first part and hopefully we'll see you in the second part which will talk about evidence behind uh, some of the interventions already mentioned in my lecture.